Last week the fossil fuel crisis has uh, continued. We are still without fossil fuels or just running out of what we had available. Uh, so we can't go to the grocery stores easily and there's nothing fresh at the produce uh, in the produce section so we're basically buying uh, stuff that is staples dried made already um, other than that people are just you know starting to hunker down starting to grow things in their gardens which makes it tougher to get supplies for gardening which is good and bad I mean it's good that people are planning and making gardens that's wonderful but it stinks for me because I've been trying to get uh, different materials and things and they're, they're running out, which is honestly fine. Um, we have everything we need at this point, but it's always nice to build up a little more. So anyway, uh, thanks for joining us this week. Uh, we're going to look at uh, a couple different projects. I pressed my cheese. We have a lot of starts in the greenhouse, so we'll keep an eye on those. Uh, we're building a lot of beds and, and I planted a whole bunch of flax. So we'll see those and a couple of other things on uh, this episode of Food Mageddon. Thanks for tuning in. First thing we're going to look at is cheese. Uh, as I said last time, cheese is a great way to save excess dairy uh, from pre-industrial times and I guess we enjoy it now uh, as well. But uh, I wanted to get practice with uh, whatever milk we have available in the grocery store uh, so that when I am able to find a neighbor with cows, I can make uh, large amounts of cheese successfully. So I am continuing my practice with uh, cheese making and this week I pressed my cheese into a round and then I waxed it. Now it's time to pop the cheese out of the mold. So I had a bit of a problem with this cheese and when I was in the curd heating stage I let it get too warm. I let it get over 100 degrees. It was like up to 105. It made the curds really seem like they were melted. Uh, rather than kind of sticking and forming together and in most of the cheddar cheese videos I've seen online uh, People are able to crumble the cheese before they put it in the mold and I was never able to do that It was still kind of like a half melted cheese So this might be too soft to press and it might not actually uh, Survive the aging process, but We'll give it a go and see what happens And cross our fingers that it will be a uh, survivable cheese for all involved. Obviously this was a jerry rig throw together cheese mold and uh, once I've done it a few times I'll build something a little more permanent but it worked for the first time. Let's see how our cheese looks. So it's actually uh, firmer than I expected so that's good. It's got some discoloration from the pan um, looks like a cheese. So now what has to happen is it has to sit on a rack in room temperature for one to three days for the skin and rind to develop. And every day I'll flip it, uh, but otherwise it just sits here like a cheese. So after three days of drying, I coated the, uh, the cheese in paraffin and the outside had gotten pretty dry. Um, and form like a rind and then this paraffin wax should keep any moisture that's left in there in and all the bad microorganisms out. At least that's the hope. Uh, I labeled it, dipped it in paraffin wax and yeah it was actually a pretty uh, satisfying process. Well, today's Friday, and 
even though days of the week are starting to kind of lose their meaning as pretty much everything gets canceled as fossil fuels aren't available, I'm trying to make a schedule for myself. And one of the big things for me is Friday is kind of clean up the house day, but it's also maintenance of the fence and uh, other, other infrastructure around the garden. So that's what I'm up to today. One of the big problems is that vegetation grows up underneath the fence. And when the vegetation touches the electric fence, it shorts it out and drains the battery. Uh, not only that, it reduces the amount of charge available to keep rabbits, raccoons, and deer out of the garden. So every week I go on and I hoe up any vegetable matter that's growing up underneath the fence. Well now I have, now I have a shelf to put all my starts on so I can get them out of the house because they're kind of crowding the back window and you know, uh, Lauren would like to have her dining area back. <laughs> been waiting for two years to have a functioning greenhouse uh, and I finally do getting all these out of the house and into where they belong this is uh, pretty exciting in addition to working on the greenhouse uh, I've also been continuing to make garden beds it's almost a never-ending process in the spring because we have to get all the cardboard out all the mulch out uh, source all of the uh, compost and everything else that we need to do so it's been busy and it's been extra hard because we have less gasoline available so this month I basically have one tank of gas for my truck to get all the mulch all the compost all the cardboard everything I need for the garden this month uh, I only have one tank to get it with and I have no idea how much gas I'm gonna have next month if uh, all of this continues hi hi Yes, you're such a ham. You're such a ham. Today we are out here to get some beds ready for the peas. The peas are sprouted, they're coming up, they're ready to be transplanted soon. So I gotta whip these beds into shape. So let's do a quick discussion of what I have here. And the point of doing all this, of course, is to keep my weed load down. Uh, it also builds soil. I'm not churning it up. This is called no-dig gardening. If I turn it up, and I destroy everything that's in it. Uh, it also breaks down the microbes and the microbial life, the, um, the fungal life, all the things that make soil soil get disturbed when you deep till it. That's why I'm doing this no dig method where I cover everything up and mulch it. Over years, I'm building up more and more soil. I have a foot of deep soil here and that's because I've been doing this for three years now. As I said, this is year three of no dig gardening, so let's just have a look. So these are cilia, these grow all, they're kind of invasive, they grow all over the neighborhood. So, but if we go down a bit farther, you see we have pretty good, uh, uh, we have good soil all the way down. And a lot of this is originally clay, but because we just pile on more organic matter every year and smother it, we're really able to keep the organic content high and even though I put in cardboard on I'm going to plant through the cardboard so this is the medium I'm going to be planting into and as I'm hoeing this all uh, together to prepare the bed for the year I get any incipient invasives that I see I saw some wild parsnip over there and some others so I try and prepare it as much as I can um, before covering it up and each year there's a less and less weed load I'll see if I can rustle up a picture of what this looked like before. Uh, it was completely grown over with uh, invasive uh, trees and brush. Um, all of this that I'm putting on will break down and become soil next year. And so I have my two pathways. I've got my cardboard covered by um, straw. And if we move over here, you can see how we're making it. So we've got um, a bed covered by cardboard. These are the sides of the bed, pushed off to the side. This will be a pathway, it's gonna be filled with mulch. And then this 
is the next bed that hasn't been worked yet. I'm gonna pull last year's, um, I'm gonna pull last year's pathway onto it that's rotted now, cover it with cardboard, cover it with straw, put the sides on, and it'll be a good bed just like all the rest of them. last year with a lot of success actually. Um, one of the things we try and do at the Lizard Technology Institute is figure out how to house, clothe, and feed ourselves without fossil fuels. Food is obviously the one I'm really concentrated on this year, uh, but sometimes I feel like I don't give enough shrift to clothing. And so my goal last year was growing enough flax to make myself a shirt. And I'm still in the process of processing that flax. Uh, but this year I'm going to grow flax for the seed, uh, but I'm going to use that same flax seed that I grew last year. I got a half a pound of avian flax, and this year I'm going to grow two pounds of uh, avian flax, which is what I, I got from last year. So I've got that here in the cart. I'm going to clean up this area and then put the flax in. Luckily, flax requires less preparation of the ground than everything else because flax grows so prolifically it blocks out all other weeds. So it's a great kind of cover crop for me uh, and real easy and fun to grow. So now after getting most of the overburden off of uh, this triangular plot here, uh, now I'm going to just scrape the surface a little bit uh, with this wheel hoe so that I can create the rows uh, in which I will be planting the flax seed. I'm not really digging deep. I don't want to disturb the soil too much, but I do need to break up just this surface area Number one, to get the seeds in, and number two, to get uh, this light vegetation on top disrupted so that when the seeds emerge, they can quickly overtop and uh, outcompete out uh, the weeds that are here. So in the pre-industrial world, draft animals were really, really important because uh, they could plow up a lot faster than I could, and I'm not even plowing, I'm just scratching the surface. An acre is originally defined as the amount of space a man and a horse could plow in a day. Obviously, uh, doing an acre like this would take me a very, very long time. A couple of days, three days, four days, I don't know. I don't want to find out. It would blow out my elbows. I have to adjust this so it's a little less stressful on my elbows. But now, without fossil fuels, draft animals would be really important. And I don't know if it would be possible maybe next year to talk to some of my neighbors. There's horses within riding distance of here. And I, I can't imagine they've ever been used as draft animals, but it would be interesting to talk to the owners about possibly plowing this all, maybe not plowing, but scratching this all up for me next year, just to save me days of work, uh, freeing me up to do other things. And in exchange, I could give them food or something like that. That's the sort of thing we have to start thinking about now that we don't have easy access to fossil fuels to run our rototillers and our other uh, tools that usually uh, make quick work uh, of what is actually pretty slow work when you don't have the uh, embodied energy in fossil fuels available. Oranges aren't actually my favorite fruit. I actually really like apples. Um, the thing is, right now, uh, oranges were available at our supermarket. We're starting to see major disruptions in, in what we can buy. So the produce section is pretty ghostly. Uh, there's really not much in terms of lettuce, hot peppers, uh, anything that needs to be shipped quickly, it's not there. Oranges uh, are actually really ecologically friendly because they can be grown and ripened on the tree and then shipped slowly because they hold up, they have a long shelf life. Same thing with apples. Uh, they are out of season right now, so a lot of our apples in the spring come from south of the equator, so there aren't that many available right now, but come the fall, there should be a lot. They can be shipped on trains and other slow-moving, uh, very efficient transportation methods. So I'm eating oranges now, that's fine. Uh, I'm looking forward to apple season though. One way that you can kind of look at what collapses in the loss of fossil fuels is the carbon footprint. 
And so I'll link to a talk I gave. Uh, I'll actually put it out as a podcast um, at a recent uh, gardening expo uh, where I talked about the carbon costs of growing different plants. And really I, what I'm showing people is how carbon intensive it is to grow things like asparagus off season or uh, lettuce off season. Really the main takeaway though is buy in season, buy locally, and yeah, you're not gonna get lettuce in the middle of winter, but that's fine, you'll enjoy it more in the spring. We're really looking forward to salad season, which should be starting here soon. So um, yeah, I'll link to that, uh, and you can have a listen. You can also find uh, other similar lectures, like on the history of gardening and other things. Um, if you go to your favorite podcast app, and look for Low Tech Lecture Series. That's Low Tech Lecture Series. I'll link to it uh, uh, below here on the YouTube page. Uh, but it's available on iTunes, Stitcher, Google Play, all these different places. And there's all kinds of interesting, uh, I hope, uh, lectures there uh, that I've given over time. So check that out and, uh, I don't know, enjoy oranges and other things while we have them. So I had to do some work with my flax seeds. They've gotten a little bit of surface mold. So I washed them with hydrogen peroxide and then tried to rinse them and they never dried out fully. So my cedar didn't work. I had to broadcast them. So what I did was I literally walked back and forth and by hand spread out the seeds as evenly as I could. And so now I'm just going to rake them in and trample them down. Pretty low tech. So just behind my flax field over here I've got my potatoes. Uh, this is one of a few potato fields I'm making um, and the idea here right now there's piles of straw but what I'm gonna do I already have some rows that I've dug in with the real hoe and what I'm gonna do now is put the straw down between the rows and that is hoping to smother the incipient growth that we have here leave the rows open I'll plant the potatoes put down compost turn them all together and then as the potatoes grow up, I will move this mulch over on top of the potatoes to hill them up. I grow my potatoes on the surface, and the reason I do that is because I conducted a study with 10 market gardeners in southern Wisconsin. And we tried all kinds of different methods, five to be exact, different methods of growing potatoes. Growing them on the surface under uh, straw mulch, under newspaper and straw mulch, digging them in, hilling them up like traditionally, growing them in potato towers, and also growing them in grow bags. And we found that planting them on the surface is probably your best bet if you have space because it takes the least amount of energy for you to dig up each pound of potatoes. On a per pound basis, planting them on the surface is half as much work as digging them into the ground while it is only a small percentage less productive uh, in terms of tubers per square foot. So. Uh, I have a whole video about this and I will link to that here. You can check that out if you're interested in learning more about the uh, potato study that we did. But suffice it to say, we plant on the surface with some compost and mulch. Well, that's all we have for this week. We were off last week and the reason was that we had to do some uh, beekeeping. You can find a video of that on the Low Tech Institute uh, YouTube page under our other videos, the Low Tech video series. So uh, maybe I'll link to that right here. So have a, have a look at that and see some of the other work we're doing uh, around the Institute. Uh, be sure to check back next week because we'll be planting potatoes and doing a whole bunch more in the garden and in the kitchen. Subscribe to make sure that you get each of our episodes as they come out. And please consider uh, liking the video and sharing it with a friend. We'd really appreciate it. Uh, next week, I hope to also get a podcast out, or at least in the next couple of weeks. Uh, you can find that under the Low Tech Podcast on most of the major podcast carriers. Uh, you can also uh, reach out directly. I'm Scott at lowtechinstitute.org. And I hope you're all staying safe out there. Uh, thanks for joining us, and uh, take care.